Welcome to Stories and Songs, a series of interviews with musicians in the world of jazz and improvisation. I'm Sophia Carbonara, and it's my great pleasure today to be talking to Helen Salvador. Hello, Helen. Hello. Thanks for having me. Of course. Um, my first question for you. What have been the pivotal events in your musical journey? There are quite a few, but I would say the first main one was actually deciding to pursue jazz and improvised music in the first place because I grew up in a family of classical musicians and my grandparents were also three or four of them were um, classical musicians as well. So I always grew up with classical piano and flute as my main focuses. And then when I turned 17 and I was in grade 12 of school, I suddenly just lost this connection with the piano and I already had lost it with the flute. And I just thought, oh my God, what's next? And my dad encouraged me to audition to the con in Brisbane on jazz bass. And at that point, I just played the bass guitar uh, a little bit in school. Didn't know how to improvise, didn't understand anything about jazz harmony. And I got in. <laughs> and then when I was 18, in my second year of uni, the biggest pivotal moment was going to double bass and choosing that as my major. So I think that's the main, you know, huge kind of defining factor of my trajectory since then was actually just listening to my gut and going, I, I don't resonate with this anymore, but I am interested in uh, improvising. And then since then, the next pivotal moment was very much going deep into the double bass and what it could offer sonically. And I still continue to do that constantly, but a big part of that was moving to Europe to study my master's. Um, because I was really interested in the German style of bass playing. I guess you could you could make it more generalized of like the kind of European, European uh, contemporary style of double bass playing. But there were quite a few teachers in Germany, particularly Cologne, who I was really interested in learning from. So I sought lessons with them, um, including Sebastian Grams, Dieter Manscheid, uh, Robert Lanferman, and spent two years over there between the Netherlands and Cologne studying contemporary double bass and extended technique. So I would say that was also a huge defining factor and pivotal moment for me because I went deep into sound and I went deep into my instrument. And from there, it's just informed some huge uh, aspects of my creative practice moving forward where it's very much sound based. It's very much uh, driven by curiosity and kind of challenging expectations of what the double bass can do, because that's what that, you know, group of teachers especially did for me when I first heard them play, I went, wow, I had no idea that this was possible. And I think as part of that, I want to also challenge other people's expectations of what the double bass does and what it can offer sonically and musically. So yeah, they would be the two main pivotal moments, I would say. That is so beautiful. I'm definitely inspired by our relationship with Obby, as, as, as are many. Um, my second question for you, what obstacles have you had to overcome during your musical life and how have you dealt with them? I guess repeating a tiny bit of my previous answer, I guess, was the first one was starting improvisation very late or what felt like it was very late for me, uh, you know, really pivoting majorly from classical to jazz very suddenly was quite terrifying because I, you know, being a 17 year old, I thought, oh, you know, I should just do what I've been doing my whole life because I've got to play all this game of catch up and everyone's way further ahead of me in this style of, you know, making. And that was terrifying. And at first, I guess it was an obstacle, this game of catch up that I had to play in starting to study jazz and improvisation and a new instrument because I felt very uh, exposed and very vulnerable in that in that way musically. But I think I was thinking about this question a little bit and actually I think that ended up being a real asset as well to my musical development because I was really inspired by the people around me to kind of, you know, do that game of catch up and work really hard to to, you know, figure out what is it that I'm studying and what is this style of music that I'm so unfamiliar with, but interested in. Um, so I think that was one one huge uh, obstacle in the beginning. And 
Of course, an obvious one, I guess, would be COVID has been a huge obstacle in my career so far because I'm turning 30 next year. And so I guess when COVID was happening, it was, you know, in that mid 20s time when it really started to kick off. And I think at any age, it's been, you know, such a huge uh, disruption to all of our lives. But I think for me as a, you know, young emerging artist in that time it was, it was, yeah, very, uh, very difficult to maintain that motivation and that drive. Uh, but as part of that, I guess I had to record an album in that time. And that was, it's called The Odd River. And it involved eight musicians and it was contingent on a timeline uh, as part of the Friedman Jazz Fellowship grant. And it was such an obstacle in the beginning to not be able to record that in the studio as I had planned. But actually out of that came this multi-tracking chaos, which ended up being almost more rewarding actually. So I think that would have been another huge obstacle that again, ended up kind of positive. And the other main one that I want to mention that is ongoing and I'm trying to figure out how to not make it ongoing is just burnout, um, creative and physical burnout as a freelance artist, because I think we're actually in a very privileged position in Melbourne that there's so much stuff happening, so much opportunity, so much space for people to be themselves in the realm of creative music. But with that comes, you know, this also this overwhelm or state of overwhelm where there are so many opportunities and it's hard to know what to prioritize and what to spend your energy on at times. So that's another obstacle that I continue to try and work on for myself where I'm learning to be a little bit more mindful of what I'm taking on or how realistic it is to say yes to everything as opposed to even 40% or 50% of the things that I might be offered or asked to do. Um, yeah, they're the big three. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I learned so much just from hearing about them, from hearing about your experiences. Thank you. Mm. Um, my third question for you, do you have a motto or a personal philosophy that guides you or what advice would you share with younger musicians? Yeah, my motto, recently I've kind of come to this realization in my work that I do have a motto uh, and that came out of a residency that I did in Helsinki earlier this year that was supported through Creative Australia and it was part of the Helsinki International Artist Program. And it was a three month residency on Swarmanlin Island, which is 10 minutes from Helsinki, this isolated, beautiful area in the middle of winter and there was no outcome needed. They just gave me three months to create and explore. And through that, I think because there wasn't this outcome pressure, I realized that practice is kind of everything. <laughs> and it was during that time that I realized that because I was almost going into that expecting to be playing the bass, singing, composing, recording, you know, eight hours a day. And some days I just wouldn't even touch the instrument. I would just go for a walk. I would take photos. I got really into film photography, uh, not seriously, but just got into that as a mode of documentation. I started painting uh, again. I used to paint a lot. I thought it wasn't relevant in my uni time, so I stopped. It became very relevant again. And there were all of these aspects of my creative practice, a way of existing in space that came back to me and I was like a child again because I had time and I was able to allow myself that curiosity because I had time and space that was, you know, generously afforded to me. So through that, I ended up writing an article for the Australian Music Centre uh, Resonate magazine a few months ago about this and about what practice is, because coming from my classical upbringing was very much in my way of thinking about this word that practice is sitting down at your instrument or standing up with your instrument and practicing the same thing over and over again until it's perfect, right? And solidifying it, refining it, maintaining. And I've always struggled with that anyway, which is probably why I quit classical music, to be honest. I was terrible at practicing in that way. And I think going into improvisation and composition has been just a total, like, it, it just had to happen for me anyway, because the way that I practice, and I've realized this now, is 
time on the instrument, but that's only, you know, 30% of it for me because the rest is thinking about ideas. The rest is recording voice memos into my phone. The rest is taking field recordings, painting, drawing, even just talking with people about music, listening to music and just existing in, you know, whatever comes to you in that moment, just existing in that space and acknowledging that space. And to me, that was such a huge finding or like realization as part of this residency, because suddenly I had all the time in the world. And yet my way of practicing didn't change in terms of hours on the instrument, but it changed in terms of having space for other things to, to come. And it's all ends up kind of solidifying into this unified way of thinking creatively, where it's, it's all actually relevant. So that's been probably, yeah, the biggest thing that I've realized is my own personal motto is that I'm not bad at practicing, but it just is different for everyone in terms of what that means. And it can be as simple as like returning to a childlike state of curiosity. So, yeah. It's so beautiful. I love hearing about your experience at residency. It's so, it's really inspiring. It's really mm. inspiring. Um, my, my final question for you is for you to nominate, and you mentioned some of your music that you've created already, but could you nominate a, a song and album of your own creation for us to listen to? And mm -hmm. tell us, you know, what that means to you or what the story of that music or why you're sharing that now. Yeah, so it's of my creation, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I will nominate the one I just released, which is called The Odd River. And I guess I just spoke about it a little bit. It was created during lockdowns in COVID. And I, I was lucky to win the Friedman Jazz Fellowship in 2020 and be afforded a grant to make this work. And I proposed to create the soundtrack to a film that hadn't yet been made. And the film was to be about genetically modified vegetables and fruit. So the vegetable theme has been very strong in my work and I've tried to ignore it and it just continues to resurface. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna go with this and continue to go with this. And long story short, I ended up multi-tracking an album, 30 minute soundtrack of pieces with eight of my favorite musicians, all of which you can find credited on the album. I won't list them all now. Um, we recorded that. And then I sent the music over to Brisbane based filmmaker Angus Kirby, who responded with this crazy story that knowing his work, I knew it was going to be crazy, but it was crazier than what I could have imagined. And it was better than what I could have imagined. So that is an album in itself that I'm very, very proud of because it's been a huge uh, process and many setbacks, many obstacles into getting it out there into the world but it's finally released on earshift music and we did a screening of the film in um a few months ago i know you were there so <laughs> um and that was really beautifully received and we're looking at other other modes of uh, sharing that publicly as well with the film so we've got another screening coming up in the engine in brisbane soon and yeah gonna try and get a festival spot for that next year hopefully but in terms of musical material, the music is out there and uh, it's, yeah, it's kind of genetically modified produce in sound, I guess. And it's in a larger sense about, you know, the climate and the really terrifying situation uh, that we're in, but also honing into the beauty of what the world is amongst all of the chaos as well. So it goes through many peaks and troughs in that as well. So. I feel very lucky to have seen the Odd film screening in person. I hope if anybody gets a chance to, they please do. And that was so beautiful. So thank you for nominating. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your wisdom. Really oh, thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks for having me.